so let's start. Uh, so what we are going to uh, discuss is our topic today is panel models. So panel models is very useful because it combines it combines cross section with time series. Okay, so it's basically a mix of uh, it's a mix of both. Okay, so it basically um, contains observations on multiple cross sections or multiple entities and entities you can think of it as countries you can think of it as students you can think of it as patients anything okay so any cross section so entities would refer to countries students patients governments and so on okay and this is uh studied over two or more points in time okay so i have let's say for example you can think of it as let's say um um, any example, 30 Latin American countries. Okay, so we have 30 Latin American countries over uh, the period of 1980, or let's say over 1980 and 1981. Okay, so here I have two periods. Despite the fact I have just two periods, I consider this as panel model. Or I can have also, again, the 30 Latin American countries over the period from 1980 to 2019, okay? So I have a longer period of time, okay? And the good thing about uh, uh, panel models is basically you're kind of maximizing your, you're increasing your number of observations. What we used to do at the beginning, since the beginning of the semester, is we used to just talk about cross-sectional studies. So for example, we used to have, for example, 30 countries over just one point in time. So we used to have just 30 observations. So if I have 30 observations and these observations are estimated over two periods of time then i have doubled that amount i have 60 observations right so the number of observations is the number of cross sections times the number of periods which is in this case two if i'm observing it over 10 then it's 30 times 10 if i'm observing it over 20 then it's 30 times 20 and so on all right so it's good because it maximizes the number of observations we have um, the notations that we use for panel models are like this so i have a model that is y i t equals to beta naught plus beta one x i t plus u i t and of course i can have multiple of the x's right uh, so but here i have just one x um, and then the i here stands for the cross sections from one all the way to observation or cross section number n and the t is the number of time periods that starts from one all the way up to the very last one, which is capital T, okay? So I'm going to keep this notation all the time. Anytime I'm talking about the cross section, I'm gonna count it from one to N. Anytime I'm counting um, the time periods, it's gonna be like from one to capital T. And of course, the number of observations, observations is equal to N times T, okay? So you're maximizing yes you have a question okay all right so it's n times t so n times t is the total number of observations previously since the beginning of the semester our t used to be just one 
right? So that's why our um, observations of the time were n times one, but now our t is two or more, we're talking about cross-sectional, um, we're talking about cross-sectional uh, data set that is multiplied over time, all right? So, so from now on, like I and T all the time is just our reflection of the entities and T is our reflection of the time. So this is just notation, okay? Um, many examples that you can think of, I said like Latin America over time, you can have also 420 uh, California uh, school districts. right, in or over the period 1999 or all the way up to 2010, any number. Okay, so this is again an example of multiple cross sections, multiple points in time, okay? I'm sorry, my handwriting is crazy. Okay, and just, all right. So one of the, important things to um, note about panel models is whether this data set is balanced or unbalanced. So we have to differentiate between two things. One is called balanced and unbalanced. And the balanced is basically I have complete data set, right? So I have complete N and I have complete set of T. So I don't have any missing observations. If I have missing observations, so I have missing points, or if I have missing observations, then I so, uh, call it unbalanced panel. And our assumption is we're going to be using balanced panel all the time. Okay, so if you're doing a project, just make sure that your Excel sheet is complete. You're not missing any points, you're not missing any observations, but if you do, then you just mention it in your project and, and say, okay, I do have unbalanced data set, and this is a reflection of some points are missing or some data points are um, missing. I so, about that in regards to balance versus unbalanced? Sure, yeah. So if we chose a time series from like 1990 to 2010 as given for California schools, could we, mm -hmm. would we, would that be balanced if we had all the individual points or would it be unbalanced because we don't have, let's say 1985 to 1990 as well? Yeah. So, so what I'm giving you in the example here, I'll just make sure that my handwriting, you can read it. I said here, I think this is 1990, right? Did I say, did I say 1990 or 99? What did I say? Um, I don't remember. Exactly. Okay, anyways, so here, for example, if this starts from 1990 all the way to 2010, and I have all the observations complete, I call it balanced panel. I really don't care about what happened before or after, okay? Okay. So this is not part of, uh, of the definition of balance or unbalance. The balance means that whatever I have downloaded, whatever the data set I'm working with is complete. It's not, nothing is missing. Okay. I have a quick question too. Um, mm -hmm. In this example with 420 California school districts, would the, like the school districts be the N and then the T are, as you mentioned here, like the years from 1990 to 2010? Correct. So this is exactly. So this is going to be your I. And okay. I here goes from 1 to 420. Okay. And then this is going to be your time period. And the T starts from 1990 all the way to 2010. This is your capital T. Okay. All right. Good. No problem. Um, all right. So I'm going to give you an example that is something that we have been talking about many times. We have used this example many times. For some reason, I like this example. And this example is about the wage data set or the average hourly earnings data set. So we had this example many times. Uh, so I have wage rate, let's say, or average hourly earning. I'm gonna call it wage just for simplicity. Now I have it, I used to have it just sub I, now I'm gonna have it I T, 
okay? And this one is equal to beta naught plus beta one. It depends on my education, so my weight would depend on my education, I and T, plus beta two experience, I and T, plus beta, I can have also experience squared, but just make it simple for now. I just wanna give you the, uh, a panel model and then but the good one the, the correct one would have like the experience experience square okay it and then we also age and age square but just make it simple and then we have that error term and suppose that i'm observing this model or i'm trying to estimate this model over a group of people okay and let's say i have only 30 individuals Okay, so these are people or individuals. And then I have T, I'm observing this over time and from year one all the way to year number 20, and this is in years. Okay, now uh, again, the number of observations would be I times T, so I have 30 times 20, so I have 600 observations, which is great, okay? This is, uh, let's say if I was using a cross-sectional model, I would only have uh, 30 observations. Now each individual is multiplied times 20. So this would expand the number of observations from just 30 to 600, which is perfect. Now, um, when I'm estimating a model like this, and I'm assuming like I'm doing this over a group of people, I know that each one of us would have like a different personality. Each one has like different ability. Each one of us has different IQ. Each one of us has different economic background. Like so many things that are not captured in this equation. And um, I need actually to kind of capture the things that are unique to each individual, right? Each one of us has his or her own character um, and plus other personality traits. So I need to capture this in the regression uh, that actually cannot be captured by the variables that are just uh, included here. Some of these factors that are unique to each person would be like, uh, for example, motivation right, would be like uh, your ability to perform well, let's say in the course. What about uh, IQ that I just mentioned? What about uh, culture? Let's say each one of us come from different cultural background. It might have an impact on my wage rate. And all of these are things that I cannot measure, right? I don't have a measure for it. So they are number one, unobserved, Right? When I look at the whole class, um, I cannot observe these factors, right? I don't know exactly the impact of culture on wage or on the assignment three score. I can't know exactly the impact of motivation, ability on the final exam score. I cannot observe your IQ, you know, things like that. So these are things that are unobserved and this is very important word, unobserved or unmeasured, I cannot measure it, okay? And unique to each person. So unobserved, unmeasured, and unique to each person. And also they are affecting, they do have an impact in my regression and I can tell that of course, each person's motivation would have an impact on the wage. Each person's ability would have an impact on a final exam score. Each person's IQ the same and so on. Um, and of course, their cultural background. How can I measure that? So this would be like one of the problems that uh, we would face if I'm estimating um, a model that is a panel and, uh, for a group of people over time and I'm not able to capture this. And if I'm not able to capture this, it would have an impact on the estimated coefficients because these factors that I cannot observe are somehow included in the error term. Okay, so these factors that um, I really don't know how to 
measure them, I, am not, I cannot observe them, they are somehow here. And if these are here, and these are, as we all agree, connected with education, somehow related with experience, somehow related with age, or might not, right? But I would say it would have, if they are, they, then they would have an impact on the estimation of these coefficients and might lead to some bias in the estimation of these coefficients, okay? Um, so these are things that, and this is very important, I'm going to just, uh, unique to each cross-section, constant over time, right? So I, I like, if I'm trying to measure this wage regression over the period of 20 years, or if I'm trying to estimate the impact on a final exam score over a semester, I don't expect that these factors would change over the period of the semester, right? Your motivation, your ability, your IQ, the culture. If I'm again doing this study over a group of countries over, over let's say period of years, it might change, but the change would be very, very, very slow over time. So we call these cross section, I'm gonna write it as C, uh, C as cross, section fixed effects. So the cross-section fixed effects are those effects that are unique to each cross-section constant over time. And these cross-section fixed effects would create a problem if they are not captured in my regression. Like if I left them here, they would create a problem because they would create what we call omitted variable bias, okay? They would create a problem called omitted variable bias. The coefficient of beta hat one will not be exactly equal to beta one, which is the true population parameter. It might be bigger, it might be smaller because it's capturing the effects of uh, motivation, ability, IQ, or the unobserved or the unmeasured factors that are not directly added to my regression, right? And you can actually repeat this for beta two and beta three. So the other thing that also would affect my regression or would affect the estimation of my regression is other factors that are also, let me write them here so that we have it all in one slide, on one slide. So the other thing is there are also factors that are common to each one of us, right? Let's say what is going on now in the economy, right? What's going on actually now in the whole world about the COVID-19 is something that is common to all countries of the world, right? Not only just the US states, but all countries of the world. This is something that is changing over time, right? And, um, and common to everyone. So we call this one as, let me write it in black. So we have things that are common to all cross sections and you can think of cross sections. I said before each person, but you can call it common to all individuals in the study or common to all countries of the world or common to all governments, whatever. So it's common to all cross sections and changes over time, okay? And if I'm sticking to this example of the wage, then I can, for example, say, what about if there is, for example, um, salary raise in July? So and this happens to everyone, 
okay? There is a salary raise in, in, salary raise in July, let's say of whatever, of 3%. So all the individuals in the sample, the 30 people, they would get 30%, uh, 3% increase in their salary in July. So what is this example of? This is an example of something that happens to everyone, it's common to all cross sections, to all people in the sample and changes over time. It happens in July and it stops after that or before that. You can also add whatever is going on now in the economy. This is like this COVID-19 thing. So the coronavirus. Coronavirus is something common to all countries of the world, right? It's affecting everyone and it's changing over time, right? It has like its peak and then it gets less, lesser in effect and hopefully it would disappear, right? So this is an example of what we call time fixed effects. So we have a cross-sectional fixed effects and we have time fixed effects. Also, you can add here, um, the financial crisis was also an example, right? Financial uh, crisis, and this was from 2007 and stayed until 2009. This was an example of a time fixed effect, something that was common to all the countries of the world. Yes, it started in the US, but then it spread all over the world. It had an effect everywhere and it was over a certain period of time from 2007 all the way to 2009 and again this is an example of time fixed effects so now when i'm estimating a model that has panel data set i would have to take all these into my consideration because if i don't then my estimation of the betas my estimation of beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 would be inaccurate, right? It might be capturing the things that are moving over time, common to all cross sections and the things that are unique to each cross sections and do not change over time because they are not, and they are not observed and they are not measured. So I would have to take all these factors into my consideration because otherwise my estimation of the coefficients would be biased. So let me, um, repeated in a nice, I, I mean like in a cleaner um, slide. So what we are saying is like this. I have a model yit is equal to beta naught plus beta one x one i t plus beta two x two i t. And let's make it simple, okay? So just two x's plus u i t. This is a panel model of INT um, observations and the error term is capturing everything that is called cross section fixed effects and time fixed effects. So these are in the error term. And if these are in the error term, then the estimation of the betas would be biased. And when I say biased, I mean that beta hat one would not be equal to the population beta one beta hat two will not be equal to the population beta two. And the intercept, I should have started the intercept, and also the intercept of this regression will not be equal to the actual population intercept. So my coefficients are gonna be biased. And if these are not accurate, right? If these are not accurate, then my y i hat will not be accurate, right? So we have here, um, omitted variable bias and the omitted variable bias is actually stemming from or the source of this omitted variable bias is the cross-section and time fixed effects that are 
included in the error term and are not captured in my regression. So what I need to do is actually I need to take these out, right? I need to take these cross section and fixed time effects out and I need to include them directly into my regression. And if I do so, then my estimation would be closer to, the, it would never be exactly equal, but theoretically we would say that it's equal, like almost equal, right? So I need to take this, uh, these cross section and time fixed effects out and include them in the regression. I'm not saying next, I'm not saying inside X2, but I mean like I'm gonna have like here plus the cross section and time fixed effects. How can I do that? We have multiple ways of doing that. So let me first give you an example. Uh, so the example you have it on your slides and this is one of the examples I like. Uh, so it, the example is about um, fatality rate, the traffic deaths on US highways. And this one is, um, mm -mm -mm. okay, so this one is, uh, will show us the idea of cross-section fixed effects and how it's going to lead to a bias in our estimation. So this one example is about fatality rate. And it's a very simple example, beta naught plus beta one, um, beer tax. So you are trying to see how the increase uh, on the taxes on a case of beer. Okay, so that's a box. Uh, and of course, this is IT, and this is IT plus UIT. And this is for the I is equal to from one all the way to 48 US states. Right, and then we have the time starts from 1982 all the way to 1988, sorry, 88. And this implies that the T is equal to seven periods, right? So we have seven points, seven periods. Okay, so this is the, I want you to check your slides. So this one is the number of deaths on, um, in a state, okay, per 10,000 state residents. So this is the unit of measurement, 10,000 state residents. And you have this one is the tax on a case of beer and of course in dollars. Okay, so this is dollars. And the idea is we know this already, what we expect, like with one of the questions I always ask you, what do you expect this relationship to be? We expect it like this, well, I expect this one. As the taxes increases, people would consume less beer, the fatality rate, the number of accidents on the highway would decrease and the fatality rate because of drink and driving would fall. Okay, so when we're expecting a negative relationship. However, when you check the graph that you have on your slides, you would find this relationship is actually positive. So we have like this. So this is, I'm gonna call it FR, fatality rate. And this is the tax. And the dots were like this. And then the relationship is like surprisingly positive. So the question is how come as the tax increases, the fatality rate increases, it doesn't make any sense. So when you check the results of this uh, regression, you would find that fatality rate was equal to 2.01 plus 0 0.15 beer tax. Okay, so the coefficient is 0 0.15 for each $1 increase in the uh, taxes uh, on, a, on a case of beer, 
the fatality rate would drop by 0 0.15 per 10 uh, per 100,000 state residents. Is it 100? No, it's 10,000 per 10,000 state residents. Okay, so fatality rate would drop by 0 0.15 times 10,000 state residents, okay? So it's just like unexpected positive relationship, right? So in this situation, you would keep thinking, okay, what's going on with this coefficient? Why is it positive? So it might be the case that this coefficient is capturing the effect of omitted variables. So I need to think, okay, what's going on with this error term, what this error term is capturing. And if you think about the error term, it would be capture, like it would be capturing a lot of things. The error term would have like things like um, density of cars on the road or on the highway, um, the culture so each state has a certain um, culture about drinking and driving. So maybe this is something that was not captured in um, the regression. You have also the quality of roads. The quality of roads, right? You have the quality, quality of cars. You have many other factors that you can think of, the quality of cars, quality of roads, culture, density, things that you can measure and things that you might not be able to measure, okay? So when you think about um, density of cars on the road, uh, how can this affect the regression? I want you to think about it this way. So uh, fatality rate, Again, the regression was equal to two point, and this is hat, and this is I and T, 2.01, okay, uh, plus 0 0.15 beer tax, okay? And we are kind of worried about how come this is positive. So we can think of uh, traffic density as something that is omitted, and then, So traffic density is actually omitted from this regression. And it might be affecting this um, bias or might be leading to the bias, okay? So if you still remember uh, leading to a bias or omitted variable bias, if you still remember the omitted variable bias, in order to have an omitted variable bias, there are two important conditions. I need to think about um, the relationship between the omitted variable and the dependent variable, or let's call it Y, I, T. And I also need to think about the relationship between the omitted variable and the included variable. Because actually these are the two components that would tell me whether this relationship uh, or the, this bias is positive or negative, or actually it might be nothing. So when I think about the omitted variable, which is traffic density, and whether it's leading to omitted variable bias. I need to think about how traffic density is related to fatality rate. I'm sure that you know that the higher the density or traffic density, the higher fatality rate. So the first part is positive, right? The more cars on a highway, the more the possibility of accidents, the higher the possibility or of fatality rate. Next, what is the relationship between traffic density and the included variable? This included variable in our case is beer tax. Okay. Um, 
I know that the higher the density, most states would add a tax, right? So the majority of the states that um, have taxes on a case of beer is, are also the same states that have relatively high density or crowded roads. So these two are positive, okay? So that means I have an omitted variable bias that is positive. So that means this one has a positive bias. In other words, this coefficient is actually overestimated. It's supposed to be negative. But because of the factors that I am omitting from this regression, one of them, we just discussed one of them, which is traffic density. The traffic density is leading to a positive bias pushing this beer tax coefficient upwards, okay? And making it, instead of being negative, pushing it all the way to the positive side of the number line, if you can want to think about it this way, okay? So, the conclusion is traffic density is leading to positive omitted variable bias. And that's why the coefficient of beer tax is not equal to the actual population coefficient. You can also think about another factor that is omitted. So I told you here that we can have the density. So we discussed this one. You can think about other factors, right? How could they be related to the fatality rate and how can they be contributed to the uh, uh, fatality rate or contributed to the bias? So the culture, for example, if you think about uh, the culture, I know culture is not like something that we can measure, but we can just uh, try to just make sense out of it. So if you think about the culture, again, I need to think about it in these two ways, right? So uh, now I'm going to remove this fatality rate. Oh, sorry, it's the same fatality rate. So let's see, okay, it's fatality rate again. The Y is always fatality rate. So now I want to um, think about another factor, which is culture. Right? So culture, how culture is affecting. Um, and then I might not always be sure about the direction of the relationship. It's culture, so I don't have a measure for it. So omitted variable, let's see culture. Okay, how culture is affecting the fatality rate. You can think it is, of course, a determinant. I can say it's high or low. Okay, but I, all what I can say is it might be affecting my relationship. So, culture or uh, you can think that, or can you argue, you can argue actually that um, it is a determinant of fatality rate. So I can argue that it is a determinant of fatality rate. It has an impact on fatality rate, culture, right? Different countries have different, maybe we cannot uh, actually uh, see its importance here around the different states of the U.S. because there is no major difference in culture between each state and the other one. But that, let's say if I'm comparing a group of countries in the developing versus developed countries, some countries really it's okay to drink and drive. Can I ask a question though? Yes, sure. Um, so why wouldn't you find out if beer tax needs to be squared? If beer tax needs to be squared? Yeah, because sometimes there can be like, uh, although the variable is increasing, the squared term could lead to it be actually negative over time. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. But that also, even if I have a squared term for the beer tax, we, still, we, we will still be discussing what we're discussing now, which means that a beer tax and a beer tax squared is um, related to the functional form of the regression, right? But what about the omitted variable? Uh, what, what about the omitted variables in this regression? One of the important things that we know, even without the functional form, is that there are things that might be affecting my regression, right? The, the things that are common to every 
uh, cross section change over time and the things that change over time and unique to each cross section. So we need to capture that as well. You can definitely do the square turn, right? So you can have a regression where you have beer tax and beer tax squared. After you're done with that, and after you found, for example, that it's uh, a nonlinear form, then just you need also to analyze what we're doing now. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, the other thing is um, culture, okay, um, might be also correlated with beer tax. And again, I can tell you it's positive or negative because I, can, I don't I, even, like if I have the measure, I would tell you positive or negative. But what I can tell you now, because I don't have a measure in this example for it, I can tell you that it's related to, it has some relationship with the dependent variable and it also has some relationship with the included variable. So this relationship might be positive or negative, but I don't know actually, whether it's positive or negative, and I need to capture that, okay? So how can we do that? How can we capture these factors? In this example, what I, I was like telling you about was basically cross-section fixed effects. I didn't mention anything about time effects, as you can tell. Um, so let's focus first on the cross-section fixed effects and talk about how can we capture um, these factors. Um, and again, as I just answered the question, uh, this is something separate from uh, the functional form of the model, right? If you remember the specification errors, we do have like wrong functional form, we have omitted variable bias, we have um, errors in variables, and we have many other things, simultaneous causality and so on. So I, I would have like to go as a like a checklist on all of these factors and make sure that I'm kind of passing these possible econometric problems. Um, in panel models, uh, it allows us to capture the omitted variables that are, again, let me go to the first slide. It allows us to capture all omitted variables and avoid the omitted variable problem um, that are any variable that are unique to each person or unique to each cross section and constant over time and the things that are common to all cross sections and change over time, right? So let's um, talk about how can we do that. So we have different ways. So let, the title is how to estimate panel models. Okay, so let's start with cross-section fixed effects. How can I remove the unobserved factors? We can remove the unobserved Again, the unobserved factors like culture, like the density of cars on the road, like person's motivation, a person IQ, a person ability, things that I don't see. So we, can, we need to remove these out of the error term, right? So we can, observe, uh, we can remove these unobserved factors by using different ways, okay? or different methodologies. So the number one, something called before and after regression. Number two, so this is, I'm gonna call it number one, and this is number two. Actually, I'm gonna have it, uh, I'm gonna skip one of the methods because it would be too complicated for you. So I'm gonna just discuss two ways, okay? So the number two is something called fixed effects regression. 
and the before and after regression is used when the time the t is equal to two just two years two points in time and that's it the fixed effects regression is used if i have more than that and that's why it's the more common because it actually can be used if i have two or more and we have different ways of using the fixed effects regression uh, one of them is called is based on one column of dummy for all cross sections and I'm going to explain that um, and then the other one is I have multiple columns just giving you the outline so you're not lost multiple columns of dummies and again this one is divided into two parts and I think you know this if I have multiple dummies then I have two options I can have an intercept right k axis and n minus one dummies. So I'm kind of deleting one dummy. Why? In order to avoid the dummy variable trap, if you still remember the problem that leads to perfect multicollinearity. And then I'm going to have another option is you can remove the intercept to avoid perfect multicollinearity. I mean like no intercept I still have the same number of axes, k axes, n dummies, and the n dummies for each cross section, I have a dummy. So I want you to just follow this kind of chart so that you're not lost as I pre present all these different methods, right? So I'm gonna move in order, one, two, and then three, four five six okay so i'm going to start with the easiest one which is the before and after regression and then um if time permits i don't think it's going to permit today to finish all this but um by thursday uh, it would be um covered so let's start with the first one which is the before and after regression what is the before and after regression the before and after regression is like this it's an easy one and it can be used, let's say if in your project, um, if, if you have just two time periods before and after regression. And remember like our main objective is we want to capture the fixed effects, the cross section fixed effects, the things that I cannot observe, the things that I cannot measure. And I'm sure that they are affecting my estimation, but I want to cancel them. I want to remove them. So the before and after regression would be again used if I have the number of years just two, okay? No more than two. And suppose that we have two time periods, okay? So suppose that we have uh, just, uh, let me make an, an example, let's say. Why I for the 1918 is equal to let's say an intercept lambda naught plus a uh, delta naught plus delta one. This is actually lambda, I'm sorry. Um, and then X I 1980 plus, I need to capture something that absorbs the fixed effects. We're gonna call it as F I. And then I have an error term Right, this is 1980. Where this FI, we call this FI as cross-section fixed effects. What is, is this FI? So if I want you to imagine that I have a data set like this, and I have here, this is a country, and this is the years, okay? And suppose that 
I have Argentina and I have Argentina and this happens for the 1980 and 1981. I have only two years and then I have Brazil. I have Brazil, right? And then Brazil is also observed over the same two years, 1980, 1981. I have here, this is an Excel sheet, right? So I would have like a column for the X and I have also a column for the Y and so on, but this is not my um, objective now. So let's say here I have the F, I. What is this FI? I want you to uh, think about an FI based on this definition that I had at the beginning of the class. Okay, so what I said about the, where is it? Okay, so what I think about FI is something that is unique to each cross section or to each person or to each country, right? And does not change over time. It's constant over time. So based on this definition, I need to create a number that is like a code unique to each country and does not change over time. So if I want to do that, so I'm going to go back here to my Excel sheet and say, okay, Argentina need a code one or whatever number one that does not change over time. Brazil would have two that does not change over time. And then let's say Peru, whatever country I have next. So I again have, let's say Peru and then three, three. So the FI here is called the cross-section fixed defects, and it's actually representing what our definition is saying. Cross-section fixed defects are unique to each cross-section, does not change over time. And this way we are capturing the fixed effects into our regression out of our error term. Okay, so now we have captured it into the regression. So we have created actually a column in our Excel sheet uh, before importing it, let's say, into Stata. And this column would be including the codes for each country that you have created. So now back to our model, we have two years. So I'm gonna repeat this to the next, uh, to the other year, which is I, 1981, right? Um, and the same intercept. Right, it's a fixed because it's the same intercept. And then assume that this is for 1981 plus, remember, I don't need to have a sub T here, right? I don't need the sub T because it's the same number. It does not change over time. So I can forget about this. Plus UI 1981. So now I have two years. In order to remove the FI, FI again, it's cross-section fixed defects, or you can actually call it more generally, you can call it entity fixed effects. So some textbooks, they call it entity fixed effects, or you can call it again, cross-section uh, fixed effects. Okay, so whatever you like. Now I want to remove this impact of the fixed effects. It's a number that does not change over time. I'm sure that you understand if I subtract this equation from this equation, I can cancel these two, right? So I have captured them and then doing the regression in first difference, I would be able to cancel them. So that's the idea of the before and after regression. The before and after regression is to run your regression in first difference. So we can do it this way. So now take the first difference. Why I'm doing that? To cancel the impact of fixed effects, so to cancel or to move the effect, the, the, the F from this model, which is the fixed effects. So I'm gonna have like YI, and this is in 1981 minus YI in 1980. And this is now my dependent variable is equal to, remember the intercept, the beta node is canceled or whatever the uh, lambda node is canceled. And then I'm gonna have the lambda one XI 1981 minus XI 1980. And I still do have the error term which is the UI 1981 minus UI 1980, okay? So now we have used the first difference in order to remove 
or we have removed, we have removed, right, the entity fixed effects. Or we have removed the unobserved variables that this is very important, okay, that are constant over time. Or the most important conclusion is we have um, eliminated the source of omitted variable bias. Okay, so doing that, this ensures that we get, this ensures that we get consistent estimates, right? So we're getting consistent estimates of our regression. Um, again, this can be done, and when I say consistent estimates, just again, my expectation of whatever my coefficient was like lambda one hat is equal to the true, right? Lambda one. This is the slope next to the axis, okay? So we were able to get consistent estimates by removing the cross-section fixed effects. If we go back to the example of fatality rate, I'm just, uh, you have it on your slide, I'm just going to see the numbers. So they have done that. Um, and you have that on your slides. So for example, just check your beer tax example. Okay, we have, uh, again, the example of beer tax they have done the fatality rate the model um, they if you go back to, if you check your model they you will find this uh, on i can't remember which slide number so beer tax and so this one was in 19 so they chose two years 1988 and they have created a cross-sectional uh, fixed effect that is called zi okay here i called it fi choose any letter you like okay and they do have also the error term and the error term for the 1988 they do have also the same regression for 1982 okay so what is not Yes, 19 uh, fatality rate, 1982, okay? And again, the beta naught plus beta one beer, um, beer tax. Nineteen eighty two plus, just notice that the beta two zi is the same, right? It's a constant plus, U I 1982. Getting the first difference, okay, we will get consistent results. When I do the first difference, these two are cancelled, these two are cancelled, and I do have a regression of the change in fatality rate as a function of beta 1 change in beer tax, okay? And if you check uh, the results of this regression, uh, you have it, and the results when you perform the change, this one was, cons like they, got, they were able to get consistent results, and they were like, um, this change in fatality rate, was equal to negative 1.04, and this is now expected change in beer tax. So this is the new beta, right? And 
just notice that this is not our original variable, right? Now we are regressing the variable in first difference. They were able to get expected results because we are expecting a negative relationship. Now my x, the variable here is called the change in beer tax. This variable here is called change in fatality rate. The observations are here and they were able to get the expected negative relationship. Okay, so I want you to check this example. Um, and I want you to, uh, to, to read it on, from the slides and also it's available on your textbook, right? And one of the important conclusions that they said, and this is going back to the question I just got. I'm sorry, I can't see your faces, so I'm not sure who asked me this question, but um, who asked me the question about the nonlinear regression? Ooh. So adding the quadratic term? Yes. That was me, Samantha. Okay, Samantha? You said Samantha? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't see your, okay, Samantha. So you're right. So now, this is back to your question, Samantha, when you said, okay, what about the nonlinear term? So when I, I'm done here, let's say, with my correction of fixed effects, and I'm looking at this number now. Is it overestimated? Yeah, it seems still that it's overestimated because when I look at the average, uh, like when, so th this effect is actually large given that the average fatality rate in the data set, I want you to check this example on your uh, textbook, the average uh, fatality rate in this whole data set, right? In the data set is approximately equal to two, okay? So when you compare this number with the average fatality rate in the data set, you would say, okay, this one, the estimated effect suggests that traffic fatality can be cut in half, right? Or half the average. I can cut fatality rate by half the average by increasing tax by $1 per a case of beer. Isn't it that too big, right? So if the average fatality rate is two, okay, so just the increasing $1 in the taxes uh, on a case of beer would cut fatality rate by almost half, it's still too much. Like it's too much when you think about it. So I go back to uh, Samantha's question and after we're, I'm done with correcting for fixed effects, I need to think about what are the other possible um, misspecification problems that I need to capture in this model. Maybe I, as Meta said, maybe I need to have beer tax and beer tax squared, right? And one of the other things or one of the very important things and very obvious here and from this model is there are definitely so many other factors that I need to include here that are also affecting fatality. It's not, it's not like only beer tax. So I'm omitting other variables that I need to capture. The more you think about possible specific, misspecification problems, the more you would get this closer and closer and closer to the population um, parameter, or you can say, I would be able to get better consistent results or more consistent results. Any question? Let me pause here. Any question? Okay. All right. So, um, so this is back here. So this is again just one way, right? So we had before and after regression used only when t is equal to 2. I hardly use this model in my uh, estimation uh, of research papers because I usually work with larger data set. I mean like larger time period data set. Uh, so I usually go with fixed effects and you find this more common because the higher the number of observations, the um, more accurate is your estimation. So let's uh, 
discuss the fixed effects regression. We have about six minutes, so let's continue. So let's talk about fixed effects regression. What is fixed effects regression? The fixed effects regression is we have different types. Okay, so the fixed effects regression, we have different types that we can um, uh, use. And the most important thing to remember is I'm using this. I can use it if I have two time periods or more. Okay, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so let's start with the first type, which is how can I capture fixed effects regression using one column of dummy for all cross section? Actually, this is very similar to the one that we just did. Okay, so, but I now I have like, let's uh, make it uh, with a larger number of time periods. So again, I do have a column for countries and I do have a column for years and I do have a column for Y and I do have a column for X and X1 and X2 and whatever. But let's focus on the fixed effects. So suppose I have again, I'm just gonna talk about uh, the same example, Argentina. And suppose I have the 1980, 1981, 1982, 1983. And then again, this is repeated, Argentina four times. And then next, okay, Brazil. Brazil four times. So suppose I have only four uh, time periods, you, don't, you can have definitely more. Just I'm trying to make a simple example. Okay. Now, uh, for the fixed effects, let me again call it, just for simplicity, I'm gonna call it FI. The FI, again, if I want to create this column, it has to go with the definition. The definition is saying I need a code for each country, something that is unique for each country, does not change over time. So this one would be like one, 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 two, 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 okay? And then Peru, three, 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 three. And then the very, very last one is gonna be N, 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 like our, our four times N, okay? So that's it. So it's actually very, it's actually the same as this one, but the main difference is here I'm using two time uh, periods, but in the more general form, I'm just using multiple years. It could be any number of years starting from two and higher, okay? So now if I want to estimate this uh, model, I would have to create something like this, yit, is equal to, let's say, alpha, it could be like beta, whatever you like, alpha one x i t plus f, uh, let, let me have it like alpha three f i, it doesn't change over t, so I'm not going to include a sub t, plus u i t. And this one is going for all the years, right? And we are actually going to have an estimation for this model where I have the alphas estimated, right? Including the alpha of this code for the cross section fixed effects. And if this is, okay, so this is, I'm sorry. So this is, this is two, okay? So, and this is alpha two. Two. And if this is constant and this is constant, I can actually put them together, right? So alpha zero plus alpha hat two F I plus. Now, if I'm asking you what is the cross section fixed effects for Argentina? So you would go here and say, okay, Argentina is taking one. So the cross section fixed effects, let me write it this way, the cross section fixed effects for Argentina 
is equal to alpha hat zero plus alpha hat two times one. And the same for the cross section uh, fixed effects for Brazil is gonna be equal to alpha zero, I'm sorry, I'm writing here, alpha zero plus alpha hat two times two. And of course, after we estimate, we would have numbers for these alphas, so you just add them up, right? Um, and that's it, so uh, I'm gonna stop here. It's 12.55 now, and um, as I said, you can go ahead and finish your assignment, question number two. We have already covered all the questions on that assignment, and on Thursday, hopefully, you should be able to answer question number uh, one, all right? Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And stay safe and stay well. And I'll talk to you on uh, Thursday.